Welcome. Everything is great. You're listening to Fork and Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Jason. And I'm Vivian. And we'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. This week we're talking about Season 2, Episode 11, Rhonda, Diana, Jake, and Trent. It was written by Jen Statsky and Dan Schofield, directed by Alan Yang, and it aired January 18th, 2018. On a train headed to the real bad place, Michael explains the plan. They need to get to the portal in the main office of the bad place headquarters. They will need to wear disguises to get to the portal, and once they're there, they'll need pins to travel through it. Donned in their disguises, the gang comes up with aliases. Eleanor will be Diana, Tahani will be Rhonda, Jason will be Jake, Janet will be Bad Janet, and Chidi panics about lying. So Chidi doesn't actually pick his... Alias. His alias. Yeah. yeah, no, it's chosen for him later in the episode. I like that the pin comes back into play because we see the pin like a couple episodes ago. Michael's given this pin by Sean and it's supposed to be everything that he's always wanted and it's representative of his devotion to the bad place, right? But now we're seeing it and it's getting used in a very different context, which is fun. I like it. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't feel forced at all. No, no, I don't find it does. And I like Janet's little comment. I'm luggage. It's so cute because she's always been saying, I'm not a girl. I'm not a robot. I'm not a person. Like, she's always defining herself by what she's not. And now for her to say something silly like, I'm luggage is really cute. (laughs) It is. It's funny. (laughs) And also kind of made me think here because the system obviously doesn't recognize Janet as a being if she's considered a carry-on when traveling through portals. Right. So obviously they no one thinks of Janets as people mm-hmm. or as persons. So why would Janets think that they're persons? Right. Right? She's programmed mm-hmm. to understand that she's not. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Jason's reaction to the IHOP mention is great. Oh, fantastic. So good. And we don't have an IHOP here in Canada or in Ontario. Yeah. I'm no. not sure about the rest of Canada. I don't think so. I think it's an American establishment. Yeah, our version of IHOP is Denny's, which you guys have. But IHOP has unlimited all you can eat pancakes. Oh. So the Rudy Tootie Fresh and Fruity that Jason wants is oh, seven ninety nine at your local IHOP. Mm. And it's basically just buttermilk pancakes with fruit toppings. Wow, yeah. that's cute. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was interesting. I'm like, oh, okay, it's an actual dish. Of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> but he's going to get eggs anyway. Yeah. So so sometime between Jason actually throwing the Molotov cocktail at Acid Cat's speedboat and him talking about it now, he actually learned what the name is. Because the first time you see him do it, he's like, hey, pill boy, hand me the thing that blows it up. <laughs> So Jason is learning things yes, he is. about life. Are they important things? That is really your call. I think he learned it recently because he <laughs> says it so often in this episode that he's really kind of just getting the excuse to say it multiple times because he just learned it. Oh, it's like when you get one of those word of the day calendars. Yeah, you just stick it in every sentence you can. And you're like, no, that's not what literally means. <laughs> Deep cut, deep yes. cut. Yes, harsh. <laughs> so what do you think of the disguises? Very old-timey, very oh, fashionable. Oh, old-timey? What yeah, they feel mean? very 50s inspired. Oh, yes. Okay. Jason's suit, Eleanor's glasses, and the shoulder pads, and her dress, and Tahani's yeah, outfit. Yeah, Tahani's outfit yeah. is very conservative, too. Yes. She almost looks like a lawyer. Speaking of Tahani, her last name that she chose, Mumps. <laughs> Super elegant, Tahani. Very (laughs) unlike yourself. Okay, so before I talk about how awesome Tahani is in this episode, I want to say that I love the disguises. I think they're really fun. And we did have a question from a listener. Um, Susan at Susie Hula on Twitter asked us what we think of the disguises and if we think they're endemic of the folks from the bad place or just general disguises. So do we think they represent something at all, or are they just kind of fun? Well, Michael picked them out. Mm. Michael seems very fashionable, but at the same time, not modern. Like, Mm. he seems like all the suits that he wears are 
I mean, suits are pretty much timeless, but True. um it seems like something that Michael would like himself, the old fashioned style outfits. Mm, okay. So I think because they're they're so focused, like I think on like the nineteen fifties that because of how people are maybe behaving themselves in certain places in the world, they think of the 50s as like, ah, oh, the good old days of when, like, such and such a country was great. <laughs> um, and I feel like that's kind of the bad place, right? They, they're they very traditional. They've been torturing people for literally all of time. So it would make sense that they would have very... Um, like, out-of-date outfits, I guess, right? They haven't really gone into the modern age, which was also what Michael was arguing against, right? He was... He wanted to create a good place that was different. Right. Because he felt like they were just doing the same old thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. So the outfits, I feel, is just an extension of that. And, you know, kind of reminds us that maybe the afterlife needs a new perspective. Like, we've discussed several times how the system is unfair mm -hmm. um, and extreme. So, I don't know. Could be a part of that. Yeah, it's an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Susan? What do you think, listener? Let us know. So, back to Tahani. I love Jamila's American accent. I think it's fantastic. I think she's super fun in this episode. And I really like that she didn't choose someone pompous and wealthy that she could be. She didn't decide to be, like, an heiress of such and such a whatever, mm -hmm. you know? She wasn't like, oh, well, I'm going to be Satan's daughter, you know? <laughs> someone clearly important. Yes, someone very important. So she's just kind of like your everyday, all-American, down-to-earth Rhonda Mumps, you know? <laughs> I really like her trying really hard, but failing really well at being American. Saying things like, hey, pass me the NAS NASCAR ketchup. And saying stuff like, I'm going to get a tall glass of pipe and hot corn syrup and a scooter to ride around the mall. <laughs> like, oh, They're I just... love it. <laughs> I guess that's just what she assumes are, like, American-style words that people would say. <laughs> NASCAR ketchup must be a thing, yeah, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> I, I love it. I feel like she does such a good job. And even her body, like, her body moves differently as Rhonda. She's really loose, and mm -hmm. all of her movements are exaggerated, and she tends to, like, put her hands out a lot. So that's, that's fun. So, mm hmm I really like Tahani in this episode. I think she's great. Tahani's outfit really reminds me of John Travolta or Samuel Jackson's outfit from Pulp Fiction. Oh. Just straight black suit, black tie. Yeah. Mm hmm mm hmm Yeah, it was, it was nice that we got a different version of Tahani. And I like her hair up, actually. Like, mm -hmm. tucked underneath. It looks nice on her. Yeah. So, as Canadians... The two of us, I'm sure, very much liked uh, Eleanor's fake ID address. The 123 whatever street, Canada City, Canada. <laughs> that was pretty great. Pretty fantastic. <laughs> Nailed Clearly, it. Those Arizona bouncers don't care. It's like it's the great. Simpsons, 123 fake street. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That sounds legit. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... When Tahani decides that she's going to be part of the hot dog department, Michael says that there are nine hot dog torture departments. And I'm wondering what you think they are. Because number one is apparently making people into. Number two is stuffing people with. What are the others? Eating. Just eating hot dogs? Just nonstop. Oh, God. It's like a... Like an eating contest, but you can never stop. You can never stop. And Until you never... your stomach explodes and then you have to keep going. Yeah, totally. Oh, gross. It's pretty gross. Okay, others. What are the others? That's number three. Maybe everything you touch turns into a hot dog? That'd be pretty great. That would be so frustrating, though. You're like, <laughs> I just want to go to the bathroom, but you have to, like, touch the toilet seat or something. And then it turns into a hot dog. 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to I tell you. I just wanted to get something out of the <laughs> fridge. Oh, it's a giant hot dog now. Uh, I hope I wanted hot dogs because <laughs> that's what I'm getting. Yeah, it's like the Midas touch, but it's the hot dog touch. Right. You know? It's, it's the curse. You think it's a blessing, but... Right. No, you're right. thinking, oh my goodness, now I can just... I, I love hot dogs. I can eat them all the time because I could just touch everything. But then you really think about it. Whoa. Yeah. I can never touch another person again. Mm. I can never shake someone's hand. Oh, you're like the pie guy. The pie guy. The pie guy in the in the pie show. <laughs> the pie show. <laughs> yeah, the pie show. I can't remember what it's called. Pushing daisies. The pie show? How is that a pie show? Because he makes pies. Oh. Isn't he like the pie maker? I don't know. I never saw it. Oh. It was okay. canceled, so I didn't want to. Oh, okay. I thought well, I'd get too frustrated. We'll just... So... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hot dogs are, you know, hot dogs. Maybe one of the torture is you get to see how they're made. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let us know if you can think of any other ways that people can be tortured with hot dogs. All right. So, Jason, how did you feel about Chidi's reaction at this moment? Expected. Expected. Were you frustrated like Eleanor? Yeah, because he can't just put his principles aside when it comes to... You know, literal life and death. We're in hell. We need to lie to survive. Mm. But that's the whole point, right? Principles, right. principles aren't, aren't principles, principles when you pick and choose when you're going to follow them. Right. It's a good point. It is, absolutely. But at the same time, mm-hmm. yeah, it's still frustrating. Yeah, no, I was frustrated too at this point. But he does make a good point about the possibility that the judge would calculate, like, the sum total of their actions in the afterlife, maybe. Right? So, right now, at this point, none of them know how the judge is going to react. So, Chidi's just trying his best to behave morally. Mm -hmm. Regardless of the situation. Yeah. I think he's just really worried about what could happen if he does behave immorally even though he knows at some point he's gonna have to do something he's uncomfortable with what if the judge doesn't follow those principles though yeah i mean chidi's just assuming that the judge has the same code of ethics that he does yeah that's very true that's just like all the religions in the world thinking theirs is the right one Mm. Mm Hmm. well that's chidi for you yeah and look where he ended up yeah just like eleanor said that's true and really, Kant's maxim of lying, it, the, the whole thing, it does kind of bug me because there are certain situations where lying is really your best option. And yet he says that if you lie, you're acting as though lying is permissible and everyone should lie. And you're like, no, that's not what I'm saying. But your blanket, your blanket statement is just outrageous. Yeah, well, that's that's Kant for you. So were you shocked when Eleanor finally got to swear? Nope. I wasn't actually surprised either. It kind of just slipped right by me until she noticed it. Because I've gotten so used to people swearing on TV that I just kind of forgot. Oh, right. You guys don't swear on this show. You Mm -hmm. haven't been allowed to swear in 800 reboots. And now you get to say ass. Well, somebody pointed out on Reddit that they did say ass in the very final episode of season one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's just a little, there. Hmm. It's a little continuity, but it's not really that important. <laughs> do you remember our, Do you remember our episode last week when I said that we'll likely hear something like, oh, it looks like somebody's got a case of the Mondays or... <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then it happened. <laughs> Boom. Booyah. <laughs> not bad. Not bad. Oh, yeah. You called it. Just quickly going back to the dumbass. I think as much as it is just fun to hear Kristen Bell swear, and I know that we're not going to hear any F-bombs soon, I think this is just a sign that the world that we know and the show that we know isn't the same anymore, right? Last week, the fake good place disappeared, and now we're thrown into this new world with different rules, Mm -hmm. and we've just lost the safety of the fake good place, just like the four humans have. Right. Right? And... I think that's fun and interesting. I really liked this episode because it was 
so different and fresh and exciting and I didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah, all the rules, all everything we know is pretty much gone out the window. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's exciting and new. Mm-hmm. It takes us out of our comfort zone for sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it takes everybody else out of theirs too. Yep. Even though Tahani and Jason actually do quite well in the bad place later on, Eleanor seems a bit uncomfortable, and then Chidi is definitely uncomfortable. And Janet, she's not so much a bad actress, I think, as she is just trying to override her programming, which must be really difficult. And I like that she's still learning too, right? She can lie at this point. We found that out. She can apparently be passive aggressive. Totally fine that you didn't notice. But being mean is a very different skill than that. Mm Mm-hmm. Right? So she's still trying to figure out how to swear and how to just be rude to people. Hey, butt ass. <laughs> so when bad Janet's, we, we've seen when bad Janet tries to be good, she mm-hmm. has like a literal meltdown. Yeah. And I believe that a good Janet would do the exact same if she tried to be bad. But our Janet has achieved so many upgrades and improvements mm-hmm. that she's on she's able to actually be a little bad no it's tough bit. on her though you can see her struggling like a lot she, yeah. her voice gets a little shaky and it's like she loses all confidence mm-hmm. at that moment mm. i kind of forgot about uh the bad janet that uh that just like melted yeah yeah no that's a very good point um She really is the most advanced Janet in the universe. Yep. When she's talking with Jason about his outfit and he's trying to figure out what the pocket square is, Mm -hmm. she's looking at him so lovingly, like she just adores him and he calls her sexy and she freaks out a little bit. You can see in her eyes, she's Mm -hmm. like, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. Distract, we need to go, we need to continue on. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) Here, take this briefcase. Here. Take this briefcase. Wait, no, give it back. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like there's just little hints that they're going to be a thing again, which is nice. Yep. I've been loud and proud of a Jason and Janet shipper. Shall we continue? They arrive in the bad place, and Michael tells them to browse the Museum of Human Misery while he gets four more pins from Sean. When Michael visits Sean, he quickly discovers that his plan will not go smoothly. The four humans browse the museum, but they are quickly surrounded by demons attending an event. So I'm confused. Okay. Where are they? I feel like we're missing something. Mm. We're missing a transition. We're missing something. Like maybe there's an extended episode where we see them walking through a location. Sure. So they get off the train. They're on the platform. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly they're in this museum. Yeah, I'm assuming that the museum is right off of the platform. So that's my assumption as well, because that's all we've been shown. Mm -hmm. So that's Bad Place Headquarters? Yeah. Like, Bad Place Headquarters also has a museum right next to it. So they don't really have to go into the middle of the Bad Place, like knee-deep into the Bad Place, because the museum's, like, right there. So they're literally on the platform where they need to be is like right next to the train station. Yeah, I don't know why this is confusing. Because Michael says they will have to go through into the heart of the bad place to get to where they need to. the bad place headquarters, right? It's like where all the big bosses are, where the people who would actually know who they are are there. But they don't go through that? Well, they eventually do. They eventually have to go through Bad Place headquarters, right? Okay, so in Michael's mind, he's thinking that he's going to get them four pins. He's going to come get them from the museum, and they're going to have to walk through a very full Bad Place headquarters. Which we don't see. Which we don't see. We actually see them going through the Bad Place headquarters, but running through like an empty office, Mm -hmm. basically. And the only reason that it's empty is because everybody else is at the museum. So they actually kind of had a worse experience. They had to do more this time because they actually had to interact with the demons. They didn't have to just like walk past and pretend to be 
Michael's most trusted employees. No, I get that. I get all that. But the way the show, the way we're seeing it doesn't seem like it's very far. Mm. Or they didn't have to go very deep into the bad place. Mm. It looks like the office that Michael works at is right next to the museum, which is right next to the train station. So to me, it looks like they only had to walk like a few minutes. Right, right. Yeah. It just didn't seem like a very threatening exercise in futility. Like the way Michael was saying before they left, before they got on the train, was that this is going to be an impossible task because we have to go so far deep in the bad place and there's going to be crawling with demons. And then it just doesn't show us that threat. Mm, Okay. Yeah. I can see that. I think... I think you're right. Yeah. It's not... It's not as threatening as it was portrayed before. Like... I kind of expected that they would have to go through several different places before they got into the headquarters, like maybe through different levels or something like that. Sure. But obviously Michael found a way to get them in and out. Mm-hmm. But it's still there, right? Like the threat is still there, even though it doesn't feel maybe as dangerous. Right. Because they are surrounded by people that would totally snitch on them the second they found out they're also surrounded by people in or demons in human suits which also adds to the level of non-threateningness i guess because they all look human right so maybe if they didn't look so human or if they looked a little bit more like demons Mm. i mean it makes sense that they weren't all like cgi things and it would be a lot more expensive but yeah i guess what i'm saying is i would have liked To be shown a bit more of where they are Mm -hmm. in relation to the portal and the offices and this museum and the train station. Mm -hmm. It would have helped, I think. Okay. I do like the little tidbits that we get when we get to the bad place, though. All the little great gags in the background. Mm -hmm. Like the Pirates of the Caribbean poster that says, Pirates of the Caribbean 6, the haunted crow's nest or something, who gives a crap, playing forever. (laughs) (laughs) yeah those movies stop being good after like the second one and then we get the posters of the pitchfork which is like this very classic look and it just says elegant timeless triple stabby (laughs) and it's got a little logo of torture depot in the corner (laughs) it's pretty great it's pretty great and then bad janet saying over the pa every train is delayed by three hours just like every day but that's not really effective because no. then if you know that every train is delayed by three hours, then... You can just plan accordingly. Yeah. So it must be delayed at different intervals every day. Like, oh, 30 minutes today. Oh, an hour today. Five hours. Oh, it's not until 12 o'clock tonight and it was supposed to be at six this morning. Oh, like... crap. It's on time today. <laughs> yeah, it's on time. Once in a blue moon, you know? Yeah, just to mess you up. Mm-hmm. And then they get to the museum. Mm-hmm. The... Hall of low-grade crappiness. I like that. I like that we have a distinction between all the stuff that we've been seeing as reasons for people going to the bad place, right? It's always been stuff that, you know, that's that's a douchey thing to do. Or it's a jerk move, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem like it should really land you in hell. Yeah, maybe these were like... The final points that tip the scale. Ooh, ooh, I like that. Like, you were almost in the good place, but you flossed in your office. So So there goes those five points that really sends you down below. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That would suck. Yeah. So, like, like Chidi was saying, if you were just off by 12 points, and those 12 points were him lying. I get it. Yeah. You never know. You never know. Mm Mm-hmm. I really like the old-timey dick pic. Oh my god, terrible. <laughs> and the guy afterwards going, heh, heh, heh. The laughter is so good. The laughter makes it so good. <laughs> I don't know why I love that so much. It's just it's ridiculous. Just, <laughs> he's got the bulb in his hand and he's... It's like you know he's going to be developing that later. Oh yeah, and giggling about it. Oh god. And then sending it in the post. <laughs> mailing it to like some lady of... 
A duchess. A duchess, yeah. I don't know. Duchesses seem like an old He's going to seal it with a wax stamp oh and God. write the address all flourishly with like a quill and then it's going to look beautiful and she's going to go, ooh, who sent me this beautiful letter? And she's going to open it and go, oh, good gracious. And faint and on her faint. fainting couch, which is conveniently located. Right. Right next to her. Okay. <laughs> um... What other acts do you think should be in the hall of low-grade crappiness? Bragging about how vegan you are. <laughs> oh, I can't eat that. I'm vegan. I know you already mentioned it four times. Oh, but I'm just letting you know that I just can't eat it. Because I, I don't eat vegan stuff. I only eat vegan stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Overstating the obvious many times than more than necessary. Hmm. Okay. It's like, I also do CrossFit. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I do, I, I'm sorry, I can't go to that thing, I'm going to CrossFit. Yeah, did I tell you that I do CrossFit now? Mm. Oh, yeah, I'm, did I tell you? Yes, your friggin' shirt tells me that you do CrossFit. <laughs> okay, I get it. I think that the first person to say, well, guess it's free when they couldn't find the price tag. Oh, my God, in retail. Should be there. If you say this, stop. Yeah. Mm, it's not scanning, huh? Guess it's free. Uh, my mom does it. It's bad. Oh, what about a uh, co-worker at the office saying, working hard or hardly working? Mm. <laughs> so good. Does the, mm, looks like someone's got a case of the Munders. Does that qualify too? That definitely qualifies. So basically everyone in office space should be in hell? Yes. Definitely. Mm, I'm going to need you to come in on Saturday. Yeah, exactly. That guy. Okay. I would also say people who look at their phones when you're talking to them. Like, I know for some people it's just like an obvious sign of disinterest, especially if like a weird, creepy guy is hitting on you or something. But when you're talking to your friend and then they just pull out their phone and start texting someone, you're like, um, uh, excuse me. I hope you're, this is an emergency. Yeah. Like, you're literally texting 911 to come get your mom because she broke her hip. Yeah. Like, that better be what you're texting. Someone ought to be dead, okay? <laughs> or better be dead, whatever. So, people who are also texting in movie theaters mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. while you're trying to watch a movie with them at home. Yeah. They're like, you know what? This movie is one of my favorite movies. Let's sit down and watch it. And then let's browse on our phone half the time and then constantly ask, who's that person? Why are they saying that? Yeah, those people. <laughs> um, definitely older ladies who go to a showing of it and spend the entire time talking to each other. Oh my goodness. Those ladies should be memorialized in this. I mean, part of they the were old, so they might be there already. Mm, good point. <laughs> <laughs> and let's wipe that one. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> So, and Eleanor, and when Michael pieces off and goes to the office to talk to Sean, mm-hmm. Eleanor tells him to be careful. Yeah. And he's like, um, wait, she cares about me. No. no. It's like, Eleanor, goodness. And then, of course, she backpedals me? and she's like, no, 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 no. It's not because I care about you. It's because you're a ticket out of here. That's, yeah, that's, that's totally the reason. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's the reason. Nothing else. Mm-hmm. I find it harder to watch when you know how the episode ends, yes, though. Yes, definitely. Because they're, they're both so alike that they have this connection. Like, they're both sort of leaders for the rest of them. and They're both kind of crummy people. Yeah, yeah. Trying to do better. So, of course she's worried about him. Yeah. Yeah, he's her bud. So then we get to Sean's office, and he immediately tells Michael to axe up. Tosses I, him the container. I love that. Uh, yeah, I have been around way too many teenage boys as of late, and let's just say they put on an insane amount of Axe. I have to admit, I was once an owner of Axe body spray. Okay, yeah, but did you, like, shower yourself in it? No. Okay. I spritzed to add a little aroma. A spritz. Okay, a spritz is I was in high school. probably fine. But also, do you remember the Axe commercials? You know those guys are definitely in hell. 
the number on Sean's office was 211. Mm-hmm. Season 2, episode 11. Oh, nice. <laughs> I, I feel I so dumb because I was trying to figure out what that might have meant. And I just gave up. I didn't even <laughs> think about the episode <laughs> number. Yeah, some people might think that it's episode 10 because the first two episodes could be labeled as one, but they're really not. Mm-hmm. So, Going back to the axe for just a second, I really like the callback to Sean saying, it makes you smell the way Transformers movies make you feel when Eleanor later asks Michael, why do you smell loud and confusing? And they don't tell you why. And it's no, great because no. if, you, if you were paying attention, you'd know. But otherwise, you'd just be like, okay, that's a weird thing for her to say. Yeah. I'm really glad that they don't spell it out for you. Yeah. And have him be like, oh, that's my Transformers Axe body spray that Sean gave me when I was in his office earlier. Thank you for that. Yeah. Remember that, audience? <laughs> oh, let's just do a quick flashback where I'm in a halo. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, let's, okay. let's not do that. <laughs> I like it. That's just very much a Michael Bay movie for you, right? Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. And I really like when Ted Danson gets to act like a total jerk. I just think it's funny. Saying things like, oh, really zips my tip, which that's gross, but also like one of the best things ever. <laughs> um, And really passive aggressively saying stuff like, Oh, is that where we're putting top priority files now? <laughs> I love it. Ted Danson being a jerk. It's great. Yeah, it is as great. As long as he's not a jerk in real life. Right. We're all good. So then, the four humans, all the demons just suddenly show up. They're all hanging out for this event. It's terrible cocktail party time, right? Mm-hmm. And we see Mr. Kristen Bell, Dax yep. Shepard. Dax Shepard, Mr. Kristen Bell. Mm-hmm. He plays Chet, who, of course, thinks that Cheaty is some guy named Trent. Is that supposed to be, like, a joke? That he just thinks, like, all black people look the same or something? Mm, I like that. Because it's just so weird. It's just such a weird moment for it him is, to just yeah. be like, oh, hey, you're Trent. Uh, sure? Right. No, I like that. If it was someone you worked with at some point, you think you would actually recognize the person. It's not like a photo of them that kind of looks like them. Mm -hmm. It's a person with a voice and mannerisms. Like, what? (laughs) I believe someone on Reddit, I don't remember who, I apologize, uh, a few days ago brought up that maybe they had a prediction that some weird theory that Chidi was being tortured in a previous life, whatever, mm. as somebody who had to torture other people. Oh. So that's why he's recognized by Chet, because he is Trent, the oh. guy who used to torture other people. 800 years ago. 800 years ago. Wow. So, because we don't really know how time works in the bad place, so... That was just a prediction that I read. And it was kind of interesting, something fun to think about. Like, that would be Chidi's worst nightmare, having to torture people. Yeah. And even having to come up with a way to torture somebody oh, God. is brutal for him. So Gotta I make just... a decision. Yeah, oh, exactly. I like, I thought it was kind of fun. <laughs> um, yeah, I also read a theory that he was actually Trent because... Chidi is actually a demon who's pretending to be a human. I'm oh, that's like, fun. <laughs> I'm doubtful that that uh, theory is going to come true, but I guess you never know. Nothing's off the table. Mm. Yeah, I like, I'm happy we see Dax. Um, I really liked him in Parenthood, so I'm just happy to see him on my TV again. And he really does play a perfect bro. I a perfect noticed, douchey uh, bro. Oh, God. I noticed after rewatching the episode several times that he's dipping, like he's got the tobacco in his mouth and he's been spitting it into the cup. Oh, really? Yeah. It's gross. Yeah. Super gross. There's been people on like public transit, he'll do it, that they just have like a little water bottle and it's just disgusting in so many ways. <laughs> and he has two fidget spinners, not one, two. So, I didn't even notice one. Yeah, he's got a couple of fidget spinners, which is great because 
I hate those things. <laughs> I mean, they're they're fantastic for people who are actually like in need of them. People who actually find them useful. Like a spinner ring or something. But then you get annoying guys like spinning them on their fingers in the middle of class. It's frustrating. Let's do some tricks with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Must be fun with uh, for Kristen Bell to have her husband play a a, a douchey role like that, just mm-hmm. however briefly. Oh yeah, with <laughs> smash the hair you later and oh god, yeah. Yeah. You know, I joined a new department. Toxic masculinity. Amazing. Classic. So the the waiter that comes by mm-hmm. offering food, I get why Hawaiian pizza is on the list. Yep. I get why the egg salad's on the list. Yeah, because it's from a hospital vending machine. I feel like egg salad's like a like a Boston thing. I don't know. I don't don't ask me why. If you're from Boston and you're like, hmm, our thing is not egg salad. Well, I'm sorry. I looked up egg salad <laughs> and the history of egg salad and oh. where it might have originated from. And people are saying Ooh. France. Oh. It's very likely because of the origins of mayonnaise. Ah. And since the sandwich was approximately invented in around 1760 or so wow. that the egg salad sandwich likely originated in france around early 1800s mm-hmm. so i'm not sure where i was going with this but <laughs> you just learned a little bit about egg salad <laughs> oh boy so the the soul food from maine bagel bull shirt Come for the philosophy, stay for the egg salad research. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. All right. That was great. Thank you, Jason. Did you know that? Now you know. <laughs> so soul food from Maine and bagels from Arkansas. Yep. Uh, why are those bad? Because soul food's not a Maine thing. Maine's like super white, I think. And, like, also, you should be getting, like, fish, most likely, from Maine. Well, soul food originated from states that have a history of slaves. Is Maine one of them? I don't know. You just said it was super white, so... Well, I think it's super white. Then Maybe. it's likely there were a lot of plantations there. Yeah, I don't well, know. they're, like, fishermen people, right? I don't, right, they're I close don't, to the coast. I don't know enough yeah, about Yeah, we don't states. know about American history. I don't know. So, I'm just assuming that bagels from Arkansas don't have, like, it's not where you normally get bagels? No, it's just, you know, certain states are known for their food, like New York bagels, right? You should be getting bagels from New York. And Arkansas is far away from New York. Red lobster. Red lobster. You should be getting lobster from Maine. You should be getting ribs from, I don't know, Texas, right? You just... You don't go to Arkansas yeah. for their bagels. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Just like maybe, maybe, I don't know. You don't go to Boston for their egg salad. I don't know. You should go there for the Bostonites. pizza, right? Boston. Chicago, maybe? Chicago for the pizza. The deep oh, dish? Yes. Chicago for the pizza or New York for the pizza. Right. Depends on where you land on the depth of your pizza. Oh, Okay. Because Chicago's got the deep deep one. Pizza, or do you want a not deep pizza? Right. Break out the measuring tape. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe some of our listeners can give us some more insight about Arkansas-style bagels, whether they're good or not. Yeah. What's Arkansas known for? Food-wise. Yeah, I don't know. You know, know, other than for some reason not being said Arkansas. Yeah. I mean, what's with that? Mm. Get it together, guys. America, explain. <laughs> okay, continuing on from that. So the name drop for Gronkowski. He was the one guy who was partying on Gronkowski's boat. and Yeah, who's that? So he's a tight end for the New England Patriots. A tight end. <laughs> oh, we're 12 and we're laughing at tight end, are we? <laughs> I bet nobody has ever made a tight end joke before in their life. And you, my dear, are the first. Let's just give you a round of applause. I didn't make a joke. I just laughed, okay? Uh-huh. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sorry. <laughs> okay. He's been known... Sports terms! He's a football player. 
sports terms. <laughs> football. They have like an ovular pointy end ball that they throw to each other. Yes, they do. There you go. Pointy uh, end. <laughs> You know the bloopers are going to be all you making stupid <laughs> jokes. That's not funny. Okay. Look at ah. this. Apparently Gronkowski is known for his being a partier. Mm. So it makes sense that he would have a boat party, I guess. Yeah. And the Girls Gone Wild guy that they mean, that they name, mm -hmm. um Joe Francis, I want to say. Sure. Is apparently you know, a douche. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. anybody who comes up with that idea. Moving on to the next bit. Sean reveals that he sent a black ops team to Mindy's to retrieve the humans. Chidi has been mistaken for a torture master and asks Eleanor for advice. She explains that he needs to be more flexible, like a moral particularist. Michael anxiously awaits what he knows will be an unsuccessful mission before grabbing his co-workers' jackets and booking it. Run for your life, Michael. Run, run. So Michael calling out that it's illegal for anyone from the bad place to go to the medium place makes me wonder if Sean's going to face some sort of consequences for his actions. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? The Black Ops team interrupt Mindy and Derek in an intimate moment, which after our discussion from the last couple of weeks is a little weird for me. But anyway, it makes me wonder if someone's going to get hell for this. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe Mindy's got a contact, or maybe whoever's watching over the medium place, if there is somebody, mm. that they're going to be like, hey, now, what's this? Who's barging in on this medium place? Like, this isn't right. This isn't part of the rules. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Perhaps the judge. Yeah, they could use that as a case. Mm -hmm. They can use that as part of the case against... Maybe Sean. Yeah. Yeah. So I noticed in this episode that a lot of the characters say hell. They refer to the bad place as hell. Like Michael says, of course, there's a gift shop. This is hell. Eleanor says, well, Tahani's been name dropping even in hell. And then Eleanor also says, um, I didn't think I would be in literal hell telling my teacher slash ex-lover, blah, blah, blah. So they've been calling it hell this entire episode, which mm -hmm. is a little unusual for them. Like, they're generally calling things uh, paradise, maybe, or just the good place or the bad place or damnation or something like that. But they don't call it hell. Yeah, because calling it hell would say that there's a heaven. Yeah. So are they calling it hell for our benefit or just because it's frustrating having to say the bad place every time probably that it's more impactful maybe and they don't actually mean hell with a capital h mm -hmm. yeah i think so it's just uh it's an interesting choice yeah after avoiding i noticed it, for it so as long. well it's it's a little weird yeah and then we get eleanor eleanor talking about moral particularism which is really cool um so Eleanor explains it quite well in this episode, but just to go over it, um, moral particularism is the view that there are no moral principles and that moral judgment can be found only as one decides particular cases. So just like Eleanor says, there are no rules, really. It's only what you do in a particular situation. Well, I... From what I understand is that there are rules, but you can't have one rule to govern over every single situation. Right. There's no... I, I'm sorry. I should have said there's no universal rule that right. covers every situation. You just have to choose in that moment depending on the circumstances. Absolutely. Yeah. So basically moral particularism rejects the idea of moral principles like lying is always bad or you should always help someone because they don't believe that those principles actually apply to every situation. So for example, if we say that you should always help people, that's not really true because if you spot someone who's trying to break into a car, 
should you help that person? If you see someone stabbing somebody else, should you help that person continue stabbing someone? They're not doing it very efficiently. Right? I'll show them the right techniques. Yeah. And if there's something like someone tells you that they're looking for someone that you know because they want to kill them, should you tell them where they are because you can't lie? Yeah. So yeah. moral particularist, it's the way to go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. according to Jason. Yeah. Because <laughs> I just decided that I am one. Yes. So the author of that or the, the guy who made that moral particularist, a notable, moral particularism. A notable figure. Right. Yeah. Jonathan Dancy. Jonathan Dancy, who is Hugh Dancy's father. And Claire Dane's father-in-law. Mm-hmm. So Hugh Dancy yeah. is in Hannibal. Yep. He plays Will Graham. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'll, you'll know him from that. And Claire Danes was in Baz Luhrmann's film, Romeo and Juliet. She was. She's also in Homeland. Yes. She's great in that. So Dancy really argues that there are no moral principles, but that morality can get on perfectly well without them. So he thinks that people can still be moral agents they can still be morally good people without adhering to strict moral principles like kant right so i have to agree with him i think this is really smart i don't actually know like a whole lot about it i did look up some stuff um but it seems like a very interesting much more flexible much more applicable moral theory than the majority of the ones that we've explored on this show, like utilitarianism and deontology. So. Yep, agreed. Yeah. And I love Eleanor just saying, like a moral particularist, I am one now. I just decided. (laughs) The way that Kristen Bell does that, she's just so fun. You know? It's very cute. And even though Chidi says that he can't just change what he believes like that, he does bend in this episode. For the benefit of the others and for his benefit, too. More than we've ever seen him. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Like, saying things like peep this and ball tapping and making Taco Bell references. Yeah. Yeah, this is a cheaty we've never seen before, and I think I'm fine never seeing him again. (laughs) I mean, he's he's a jerk, right? Like, But the situation called for him to adjust, and he did. Yes. And I do like Eleanor's reminder that his inability to be flexible made him end up in the bad place. So, really, he needs to try a different tactic. Mm-hmm. Gotta go with the flow, Cheatster. Right. Yeah. Then we have Kristen and Dax having a little moment. You know, you got that good stank, which, uh, that's the worst pickup line. Ever. And of course she says, thanks. Well, of course. Of course. She just rolls with it, you know? Um. <laughs> now, I don't know. Did you notice this? But in the boardroom uh, with Sean and all the other demons, there are four clocks on the wall. And they all have these weird, like, runic symbols. I didn't notice the clocks. Yeah. They're interesting, too, because... Some of the clocks have several symbols, like way more than 12, and others only have maybe four. Hmm. So, like it's it's eight o'clock in heaven and it's 752 in hell. I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know if it's time because what does time even mean down here? Right. Nothing. If you live for eternity, time is meaningless. Mm -hmm. So, in that moment when Michael is running down the hall and he sees that, like, slug demon thing. Lance? Yeah. He's voiced by Nick Offerman. Yeah. And we were joking, like, he should be in the show. I guess he's in the show. <laughs> Very briefly. I do wonder if maybe they had him record this part because he will have a larger role in another episode. We'll see in the next episode. Mm-hmm. So, at this point, Michael runs out of the office. Yep. Sean sees that he's missing. Mm-hmm. Because the, the ops team heard that the four humans weren't at Mindy's place. Yep. We don't know whether Sean is actually... We, we don't know if Sean's actually figured it out yet. Mm-hmm. We don't know whether Sean is 
aware that Michael's been helping the humans or or anything. Mm -hmm. He's just saying, oh, Michael's gone. Where is he? Like, this is the moment where we kind of need him. He has some explaining to do. Mm. I feel like it's kind of obvious. It is. Yeah. Until we get to the end of the episode. Right. With Michael saying, hey, boss, what's up? Right. Instead maybe of he's just like, playing it casual. Like, oh, which, what absolutely. I did was no big deal. Right. Or you're misunderstanding. Like, I didn't help them escape. Uh, they got away from me. I was chasing them. Or something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, he's try- he's pulled the wool over Sean's eyes before. Yes. He's likely going to try it again. I'm curious. Mm-hmm. It, it, it did end on kind of a an odd note, so... I'm excited to see what Sean's reaction is in the next episode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or if he just realizes, man, I've been touting this as my own idea. Like, I've been saying it's our neighborhood for so long. I'm going to be the one who gets in trouble if it turns out that Michael has been deceiving me this entire right. time. Right? My boss is going to be peeved at me. Yeah, exactly. So let's get to the, the end of the episode. Chidi plays along with the demons, but the entire group is blindsided when they witness animatronic versions of themselves as the newest addition to the museum. Their cover is blown, and Michael appears to lead them to the portal. Once they arrive, Tahani, Chidi, and Jason all jump into the portal without issue. Michael then realizes there are not enough pins left, and he gives his pin to Eleanor and pushes her in, sacrificing himself. So Chidi manages to lie by just twisting the truth a little bit. He's clearly talking about Eleanor as this person that he was assigned to torture. Mm -hmm. And that's not a lie at all. He was originally her soulmate assigned to her because he knew, because Michael knew that his inflexibility, his uh, insistence on morality would just drive Eleanor crazy. Or at least he thought it would. I like it, though. I like that they sort of find a little bit of a loophole there, right? The biggest loophole would have been him just pulling a Gianyu and being silent the entire time. But here, he's lying, but not really lying. And when we see the animatronic versions, the presenter says that Michael's idea has already led to major breakthroughs in the future of their industry... And I'm kind of wondering if that's something that we might see next season. Like, what kind of breakthroughs has that led to? Are there suddenly going to be a whole bunch of other fake good places? Mm -hmm. Or are they just going to have a whole new department where they get humans to torture each other? Emotional torture department. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did you think of the animatronic versions? They were good representations of surface level humans absolutely it boils them down to their least interesting selves and the fact that jason loves his own is perfect (laughs) of course he's just like that's That's, me that's totally me (laughs) uh i thought i thought they were really fun like even though they are very much surface level for all of them it was unexpected to see them like i Could have never predicted that that was going to happen until this episode. Um, So it was just a fun moment. It was good. And I feel like Eleanor and Tahani's were the best. Because I think Kristen and Jamila were just a little bit better than the others at being like this robotic person. Chidi was a little bit over the top. Yeah. And Jason's just didn't feel very much like a robot. But... Tahani's was great, just like, which I've been to, by the way. <laughs> it's remarkable. <laughs> they did a great job. Yeah, they did. And it's nice to see that Eleanor is just like, nope, nope, that's a fair hit. No, yep. I totally mock others to uh, to distract myself from the emptiness. Yep, that's me. Yep. Poor Jason. He really doesn't get anything, you know? Just, I'm Jason. Duh. Duh. <laughs> But his Molotov cocktail does come in handy. Yes. So let's talk about the Molotov cocktail. Okay. Why does it work? Um, what do you mean? Like, why does it, like, okay. A distraction? 
I think it's simply a distraction. Okay. And the entire place isn't in flames. So it's not like he's just adding more flames to the flames. Mm-hmm. I think that's the only reason why. I think, yeah, I, I agree. I think it was a surprise. Yeah, it's and... more like commotion, I think. I don't think that anyone would have been actually injured mm-hmm. like they would in real life. And it only really delayed them five seconds or so. Yeah. So. Only long enough for them to just get a very quick head start. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that moment where Eleanor steps up to the portal and this look of understanding just flashes across Michael's face. It just gives it gives me chills like every time because I, I know what's going to happen. And it's not like I get super emotional. Like a lot of people were saying, oh, I can't even deal. Like I, I can deal like I'm, I'm OK, I think. But that moment, he just changes his mind. He knows what he has to do and he's OK with it. He has like a look of peace to him. And I think that that's really sweet. It's very human of him. You know, he's not panicking. Yeah. I think it's my favorite ending to an episode. Oh, really? Of the season. Okay. Of season one and two. Really? Yep. Mm. Okay. Well, I mean. Except maybe. Twist notwithstanding. Yeah. Like that. Okay, okay. That's not the ending of the episode. That's like the climax, I'd say. Right, right. Okay. So the ending for this episode, just Michael's, I've solved the trolley problem. Like yeah. His understanding and his whole, the way they look at each other and how he just pushes her in and the look of surprise and sadness as she's going in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it's good. It's a great moment. They really hit that... Uh... That nail on the head there emotionally. Mm -hmm. Now, I wonder, because in season one, when Tahani was talking about the largest point values, one of them was sacrificing yourself for others. So I'm wondering if that's going to influence the judge on uh, his stance on Michael. Like, is that going to be worth a large sum of points? Is Michael even allowed to gain points i don't think any of them are allowed to gain points after the fact that they've died but this is a very special situation yeah because demons shouldn't be getting any points period right right i just wonder if maybe this act will be what gets him into the real good place if he's ever allowed to go in or gives him a second chance or gives him a chance in the good place Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah for sure it was a good emotional ending I'm very excited to start the next episode. Mm-hmm. Which is the second to last episode of the season. Yeah, unfortunately. I know. I'm sad. I'm sad. But I'm also just excited to see how it ends, too. Season two has been, like, a fun roller coaster, and it'll just be nice to have the whole season all together now. Yeah. And we can watch it all from start to finish. Boom. Binge it. Okay, so shall we get to our mailbag section? Let's read some mail. Woo woo! Who let the humans out? Who? 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 Who reads the mail now? Who? 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 It's because it's a bad song, guys. Yeah, it's a really bad song. <laughs> do you remember Michael partying to that song in season one? Because we do. Our first piece of mail comes from Susan, who said, Since Sean took public credit for Michael's idea, Sean is either convinced or coerced into covering for Michael at least temporarily. Left behind, good Janet uses her super-evolved powers to save her friend Michael. Also, what did you think of the ethics of Michael having marbleized, i.e. killed, a bad Janet? Okay, so on your first point, Susan, um... I agree. I think that Sean is going to try and cover for Michael in some sort of way because his ass is on the line and there's no way Sean wants to go down. Not for this. I also think that good Janet will find some way using her super evolved powers to help Michael. I don't know if she's going to be able to get him through the portal or maybe if she can like create a portal. Who knows? That could be cool. That's a good thought. Um, I think she will definitely come in handy 
we did, of course, notice that Janet did not go through the portal. She is also stuck there with Michael. Yep. And Jason um, definitely mentioned that. Mm-hmm. Where's Janet? Yep. But I wonder if Janet's going to try and play under the radar at this point because she hasn't been discovered. She still looks like a bad Janet. Mm-hmm. And she wasn't running away with all of them, so she hasn't given herself up as far as we know. And on your third point, uh, what do we think about Michael marbleizing a bad Janet? I don't really have a lot of feelings about it. Yeah, uh, me neither. Not like emotionally anyway, right? Because we know that bad Janet is just... Is Janet like from season one, episode one, right? And I think Michael really understands how these Janets work mm-hmm. and that they're not people. Or they're never going to be good people either, right. right? So the reason that we decided eventually that Janet is a person is because she is unique. She is not simply a an AI anymore. She, she goes through all these changes. She goes through all these changes. She evolves. Um, she learns and uh, gains new abilities and new emotions. Um, we have no evidence that this bad Janet has done that. So I don't feel that bad about it. And he says sorry when he does it. <laughs> I mean, if you say sorry <laughs> and then kill someone, it doesn't make it okay. It might for Michael. If... It might be good enough for the process of marbling a bad Janet. Yeah. Okay. That's That true. clears his conscience. Yeah. But for me, it's sort of like deleting a computer program. Right. You know? You don't apologize every time you delete a file. No. Our next piece of mail comes from Alan on Twitter at Chipper Alan. He says, I don't think Tahani will meet her sister in the good place. When they go to the bad place, she will offer to take her sister's place. Mm-hmm. So Alan has told us this before, but he stands by this theory. Now that we're out of the bad place and going into this like neutral zone... We haven't seen Camilla anywhere. We haven't seen any humans being tortured. We haven't seen anyone that we recognize, actually. Not like people from Eleanor's life or Chidi's life, Jason's, Tahani's. I think they're saving that. Yeah, I think so. So I stand by that one. I think that that's a good idea. I want her to be there. So I agree with you on that one. And theory has not been disproved yet. Right. Yes. I'm really hoping that she's not in the good place. That would just be the final straw for Tahani. Yeah. So along that same line, Kate at I Do Human Things on Twitter says, So no one deserves the bad place as much as Camilla. To be so chill with her parents' treatment of her sister. To be so cruel as to not even recognize her at at a party. Entitlement at its worst. If she isn't in the bad place, I quit. Not really, but I will feign this commitment for now. (laughs) We hear you, Kate. Yep, she darn well better be in that bad place. Unless, you know, the the one divvying at the points is just a huge Camilla fan. Ooh, ooh, good point, good point. I mean, she did basically cure the malaria from, like, children in third world countries, right? Mm -hmm. As they did say in the beginning of the season. Yep. Another comment we got from Twitter was from uh, Sass Neal at Be Your Bird. She said, late comment, but what if the balloon scale does work, except what it really measures is whether you honestly believe you are your best self, because it looks a lot like the lie detector in Michael's office. Wow. Yeah, it's the same green that flashes red. Mm-hmm. I like that. I did not think of Michael's lie detector, so that's a really cool catch. Um, Last week I mentioned that I did think the scale was real and, yeah. it, and it actually worked. Mm-hmm. I think that's great. Although Eleanor does say I didn't really believe anything that I was saying mm-hmm. at the beginning. So that might disprove it, but maybe she was just kind of, you know, covering, trying to compensate. I think Eleanor is the type of person who could probably fool an actual lie detector. Oh, okay. Maybe. Yeah, I like that. I think that's cool. Especially because when Tahani goes on the scale for the third time and she's just had an outburst saying that they should just go ahead without Eleanor and Chidi, 
she knows deep down, like she knows she's not being a good person at that moment. She's no longer her best self or not acting like her best self. So I think it still works. Yeah. Yeah, that's a cool idea. And our last piece of mail comes from Suzanne. Now, this is a little bit of a longer one, uh, so we'll probably have a few things to say. Um, so Suzanne at Suza Booze on Twitter said, I think Janet's responsible for Derek. It's like saying Tony Stark is responsible for Ultron. Janet's the reason Derek exists, and the reason for his existence didn't start out great either. At least, Derek isn't expected to do anything bad. But if he's a person, then he's a child, and Janet just abandons Derek. Who's going to pay attention to what happens to him? Okay, so we'll stop there and address that point. So we both said that Janet's not really responsible for Derek, right? No. Did we say that she was? I said she was. Okay. Because she literally created him. Right. So she's responsible for what he ends up doing. But... That's only if he's doing something bad. Eh, is it? In my opinion, it is. Okay. Because if he's not doing anything bad, then he can just do whatever he wants. Okay, but what about people doing things to him? Right? Because he's not as really long as he's okay with doing it. anything. If he's okay with it, then why not? He's going to be okay with you asking him to do anything. Exactly. The that's, the, that's the thing. That's a problem, though, right? It's not, though, in my opinion, because he's not a person. Okay. It's like a computer program doing what you ask it to do. That's what he's supposed to do. Okay. All right. Oh, well, there's a the little Janet in there. I feel like maybe she should care slightly what happens to her creation. Right? Because he could mess things up for the world. You don't know. He could be messing things up for Mindy, who by all accounts deserves to be in the medium place. Mm -hmm. So what if he somehow manages to strip her of that and she ends up going to the bad place. Is that Janet's responsibility? Or is can, that Janet's fault? Can Mindy have that stripped from her? I don't know. I'm right. just saying as, as I, I don't know. I think that there's a point here. You are somewhat responsible for what your creation ends up doing. If that creation does something immoral, um, does something to harm others, you share a responsibility. Absolutely. In that. 100%. So. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. Suzanne goes on to say that Tahani contradicts that she wants to be all together when she tries to board the balloon to the good place without Eleanor getting the green light, especially when there's no guarantee that she would be able to follow. Frustrating, but in character for her. Mm -hmm. She has a momentary lapse, in my opinion. Like, she's still having her growth. She's still becoming a better person. Mm -hmm. But she still slips. Oh, yeah. We all slip. And it is a tense situation. Um, they think that Sean's going to be back at any moment. They really need to get going. So I think for her, it's sort of a, well, I don't want to be here any longer. So can we just figure this stuff out? Yeah. You know, it's in character. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And the last thing that Suzanne said was, I didn't see the hint in the last episode. She's talking about best self. That Michael was definitely on their side. I quite liked the episode, actually. Because of the other hints Jason mentions about a potential reversal, I didn't have the same faith in Michael last episode. I'm assuming uh, Suzanne's talking about the uh, the things that I pointed out. Right, right, yeah. About what Michael has said in the past and how he could be just feigning his connection to, to our four humans. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it's nice to know that not everybody um, feels that faith in Michael at this moment. That twist at the end of season one was super effective. And we've just been seeing how terrible of a demon he's been most of the season. So I totally get being suspicious of him. Mm -hmm. There are still moments where he'll have a little look on his face and I'll think, am I wrong? You're like, whoa, that's season one, Michael. Yeah, because we've been burned. Like, oh, yeah, we've been burned, just like our humans. Like, Yeah. We want to trust him. Yeah, we've been tricked before. We don't want to do it again. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Suzanne, for your comments. And that brings us to the end of Fork and Bullshirt, a Multiverse Radio production. If you like the show, please leave a rating and review on iTunes. This is the best way for others to find the show. 
And if you want to get in touch with us, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio, on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast, and you can also email us directly from our website, multiverseradio.ca. We'll be back next week for a review of Season 2, Episode 12, The Burrito. That's an interesting title. I'm it curious is. to see what the burrito is going to end up being. I already know. Oh, what? How do yeah. you know? See, when they're in the portal, oh, they get mashed together to create a four-person burrito. So the whole episode is them spinning through space in this portal, oh. all mashed together in one grotesquely shaped burrito human. Who gets to be the tortilla? Well, they're all kind of everything. And who is the avocado? Yeah, see, <laughs> it's going to be a really weird bottle episode because we love bottle episodes. Oh, so right. that, that's how this episode is going to be. They're all just going to be tumbling and like trying to figure out who's who and why. <laughs> and they're all going to be kind of fighting with each other. Right. So yeah. Right. That sounds like a good 22 minutes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It'll be a blast. <laughs> Can't wait for the extended episode of that one. All right, guys. And then the, the the end of the episode is them oh, getting to the cashier oh, no. and the cashier being like, oh, you know, guac is extra. <laughs> yes, thank you, Karen. I know. You're going to the bad place. I've already been here twice this week. Do you think I didn't know? <laughs> Thanks, guys. See you next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>